online. I don't want to be part of the information society. So that's about um, free choice there and how we handle that. And let's see uh, inclusion, ex disconnection, and connection, of course, is also a topic. I mean, if we don't have connection, uh, we don't even have to talk about this, uh, this thing, if there is a right to, to a free and universal internet or if there is not. And um, finally, that's really about meaningful access. If we see that we have um, access or is there also, are there still topic of inaccess there? So it's really about this internet contrast that we are talking today. Like on the one hand, the possibilities, but on the other hand, also asking, are these rights turning into an obligation or is it also right not to be connected or part of this information society? And how do we handle this, um, like uh, topics of inclusion and exclusion and the digital divide? So, I'm going to invite our first speaker, who is on site, that is Derek Klosa from the University of Ghent in Belgium. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. May I ask for putting my slide? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, what was more or less 10 years ago a right, a freedom, an entitled, entitlement to uh, access the internet in the past decade probably has become an obligation. This is particularly visible in aspects such as uh, e-public administration, e-governance, but in particular the recent uh, public health crisis. Those developments touch profoundly on the matters that are important to individuals, on the values that they cherish, and the values that the democratic society has been built on. And therefore, those developments can be also seen as a matter of human rights importance. Therefore, it asks a question, what human rights can do in order to protect one from an obligation to access the internet? And the answers are at least two. One of them into int is to introduce a completely new human right not to access the internet, provided it is uh, sufficiently defined, uh, realistic to implement and enforce, provided it touches upon important matter for the society and for the individual, and provided that is consistent with existing human rights. This is perhaps a Herculean task, knowing how the system of human rights functions. The other option is to interpret a freedom not to use the internet, a right not to use the internet, an entitlement, a choice, from existing human rights. Human rights has been conceived as a, as a flexible tool, responsible to, uh, responsive to challenge, changes in the society. And for example, we can interpret a freedom not to use the internet from certain existing freedoms, like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly association, and freedom of religion. I mean, in European human rights law, which I am the most familiar with, for example, freedom of expression can be used to safeguard someone's choice not to express oneself at all. You can remain silent. You might not have an opinion, you don't have to express it in certain situations. European human rights law shields people from an obligation to join, for example, a trade union in order to practice uh, regulated profession and certain circumstances, such as taxi drivers. European human rights law protects individuals from revealing their own religious beliefs, or a lack thereof, equally. Human rights to privacy and personal data protection are there to shield one from, uh, 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 from revealing their own personal data, from controlling their personal data, a topic that I am, I am most familiar with. European human rights protect uh, private choices, like uh, what to do with one's body, what to do with one's identity, what to do with one's name. Last but not least, and I already underlined that the catalogue is open, last but not least, freedom from discrimination on the grounds such as literacy, age, income, and especially in those days, computer literacy can be equally invoked to protect one from uh, obligation to use the internet. Obviously the catalogue is long and uh, not probably exhaustive. One of the, of the aims of this session is to look what all other human rights can be invoked to that end. However, this is not without limitations. Assuming that there is a new human right or 
existing human rights are interpreted in a way that actually we have a choice not to use the internet, only only few human rights and especially protection from torture, freedom, in, uh, inhuman and disregarding dis treatment are absolute rights. Other fundamental rights are subjected to certain limitations in order to accommodate other interests. And this is pro pro done by the technique called proportionality when one, one human rights is balanced versus another. So what I'm trying to say is that right not to use the internet sometimes might be balanced against other human rights or other important uh, concerns. So overall, not uh, not an absolute right, but a uh, right subjected to certain limitation. But for, even from the broader perspective, this is not to say that the right to access to the internet, so the positive right to access the internet, is something bad. It actually, uh, the right not to use the internet was conceived as an idea that Important. coercion in general uh, is bad. Uh, Therefore, overall, we have to do something not, to protect uh, from uh, this type right, of uh, uh, obligations. At the end of the day, I believe both of them, right, to access the internet and not to access the internet, should work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek, for this um, first presentation of uh, our session. Uh, next will be uh, Anuet Esterhusen from the Association of Progressive Communications. Please, thank you. Thanks. I'm actually speaking on the second top. Let me stand here, otherwise you can't see me. Um, on, on inclusion and exclusion. Um, I think, well, first I want to pick up a, a little bit on, on what Derek said about the right not to use the internet. I think that is a very le legitimate right, but I think we also have in Africa and in many parts of the global south, people who don't have the internet. And I think what we are sometimes overlooking is that this emphasis on digital inclusion, which is why we are all here, always puts the emphasis on the digital rather than on the inclusion. And what is overlooked that in fact to really have meaningful choice, whether you use it or not, um, about digital tools, you need inclusion. And in fact, if the inclusion isn't there, then that capacity to, to use the internet, to enjoy more human rights, to access public services, to interact with the state, political participation, to watch soccer online, um, as our techies were doing earlier, um, you don't have that right. And I think what is also overlooked is that this emphasis on, 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 on internet-related human rights and on digital inclusion um, overlooks the fact that the more that we embed or, or require access to digital tools and the internet to exercise our human rights, the more we actually exclude people who don't have access to it. And what we see, and there's quite a lot of literature on this in developing countries, is what one of my colleagues, uh, Alison Gilwald at the University of Cape Town, calls the digital inequality paradox. Because the more high-end digital services um, are available online, the more high-end of a device do you need, the higher bandwidth do you need, the faster access do you need. So you might be in a country like Ethiopia is busy at the moment really expanding its internet, internet infrastructure. There will be more than one operator soon. Um, but if you are in a rural area and you have a very poor connection, and you have to have a smartphone to register a death certificate of, of one of your parents, um, you can't actually do it. Because even though digitally it's possible, you don't have the devices, you might not have the skills, and you might just not be able to afford the bandwidth. So I think that when we look at, at, at human rights, at inclusion, exclusion, um, and, and the role of the internet, the choice to be able to enhance experience of rights, um, also the choice of states to, to exercise their duties in, in promoting human rights through digital. We always have to consider inclusion and we also always have to consider the most excluded. And if the most excluded people in our societies are going to have to access the internet, have smartphones or computers, electricity, and a reliable internet connection to enjoy, the, enjoy their human rights, 
are we really making progress in creating more rights-oriented um, societies um, and cultures? Thank you very much, Oriette. I mean, this is a really important point that we don't want to leave anybody behind. I need to be really careful about um, how we actually design the services. Also, to not um, you mentioned the digital paradox. I mean, uh, yeah, that's a really uh, interesting point of view, which I think merits more discussion in this respect. Um, we're gonna have our next speaker. Paolo Pasalia from the University of Pisa, who should actually have been the first speaker because he also talks about the right to, to access the internet. But I think he's more in favor of it. But let's see. <laughs> Thank you. Paolo. Uh, he's joining us online. I don't know if that's uh, working, but yes. Thank you. Paolo, are you there? He's muted. You're, mu you're muted. Yes, you're muted. And camera is also off. Paolo, are you there? Maybe you can unmute yourself. Yes. Good morning. I had problems with, with connection. Um, yeah, we can hear you now, I think. Uh, we tend more and more to define the uh, access to the internet as a right, but I think that the main problem is uh, regards the kind of right that we are talking about. I think that there are three possibilities. Uh, the first is to write to access the internet as a freedom, such as in the Reno case or the Adobe One judgment by the French Constitutional Council. Uh, the second is Vinton Cerf's uh, position according to which the access to the internet is a means to enable rights. And the third is, uh, I think the most important one, um, the access to the internet as a social right. Uh, this definition is the most important since, since it obliges government to take action in order to allow everybody to access the internet. Of course, it's if they want, direct orders. The problem is that these actions require funding. Therefore, plans to develop the broadband, for instance, can have a negative impact on other social rights. Uh, as a result, while implementing the access to the internet, it is mandatory for government to make sure that the internet really complies with the purposes for which the internet has become crucial. Uh, otherwise, one could suggest not to spend money on the broadband and save it for hospitals or schools. Uh, namely, for example, uh, the internet must be a means to acquire knowledge uh, to freely develop one's personality, to have access to the highest uh, number of sources of information. Now, against this backdrop, uh, my question is whether the existence of gatekeepers is consistent with these purposes of freedom. And ultimately, uh, are we sure that the Internet, as currently it is shaped, uh, deserves the implementation of a doctrine of the access as a social right, thus uh, it is better to implement the access to the internet rather than uh, uh, protecting other social rights. I think that it is a matter of how the internet is structured and it is protected the freedom inside the, inside the net. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, as we were already a bit uh, back in time, we're going to go directly to our next speaker, Rosanna Fanny, from the Center of European um, Policy Studies in Brussels also, I believe. Hey, Mike. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Um, I will be speaking about the contrast and the use of digital identification systems um, to kick us off. Um, just a general definition, um, digital IDs are a collection of electronically captured and stored identity attributes um, that uniquely describe a person within a given context or, and that are used for electronic uh, attributes such as the uh, names, age, gender, and also biometric data such as fingerprints or iris scans. So we know from the World Bank that uh, approximately 159 countries already use some form of a digitized ID system. Um, they claim to seize opportunities um, for businesses, the state, and also for citizens. So naturally, um, when more citizens would have access to one nationwide ID, one online public and private services um, are more, would be more uh, easily accessible and um, providing access to banking, healthcare, remote work, education, um, and so on. For example, in India, the Aadhaar system has provided access to social, social be welfare benefits for, to over 1 billion citizens um, that did not have a passport uh, before. For example, in Estonia, digital ID systems can be used to vote um, and the country even established a um, e-residency program which uh, attracts people from outside um, and numerous non-EU businesses establish um, in Estonia with their e-residency. Um, of what I mentioned, those 105 um, countries that have implemented some form of digital identification systems, um, approximately 103 of them use biometric data. Um, so that's what I mentioned, fingerprints, iris scans, um, and that's uh, about two-thirds of all digital ID systems that are already in place. Um, and this poses certain challenges. Uh, even countries already with advanced uh, data protection legislation like the EU, Canada and the UK grapple with the enforcement and the implementation of those legislation, um, meaning for data protection legislation, which is really crucial for the processing of um, such data, in particular biometric data. Um, also, it's a key issue, for example, in the upcoming EU Artificial Intelligence Act um, and the, the processes of um, Banning biometric data actually is, is, is widely debated. Um, next to protecting the privacy of uh, our citizens, um, important is also to note that biometric surveillance in public spaces is a threat to freedom as we know it, um, but already used by authoritarian governments to seize power and control. Also risks of fraud, cyber criminality and identity theft um, occur due to the large value of the data produced. Um, in addition to that, governments increasingly have disproportionate control over those digital identification systems, also limitability and volatile pol um, political agendas after elections make digital IDs really a system uh, pr prone to abuse. So as we now know, um, digital ID systems are gatekeepers to access an increasingly large amount of goods and services that are increasingly becoming essential for citizens. But especially when a person's behavior or body doesn't fit a predetermined notion of identity by the government and by the systems, then digital IDs unfortunately structurally exclude individuals and communities and putting human rights starkly at risk. Additionally, the lack of uh, knowledge and tools to really implement human rights protecting um, policies and principles disproportionately affect children, elderly and also less literate citizens. And at least five countries, we already know that um, digital ID systems have been invalidated by courts because they fail to protect data appropriately and there are numerous concerns over privacy and security. And as well as structural exclusion of minorities, the con the co these countries are Tunisia, Kenya, Jamaica, Rwanda and India. So to summarize, what do we do with that? Um, we know that there's growing enthusiasm for digital identification systems um, here in Africa, but also across the world. And there's a need to closely, more closely examine their impact on human rights, the rule of law, and the people who will be included or excluded from those systems. If implemented well, everybody would benefit. Um, but if not, digital identification systems can and will uh, continue to create a structural power imbalances between the state businesses and citizens. Thanks. Thank you very much for um, bringing in this uh, new aspect also of digital identities and um, discussing them from a really critical 
perspective. I think you raised some really important points when it comes, for example, to data protection, but also, as you mentioned, um, that the government has control over these ID systems. And um, yeah, the, the question really, how do we assure accountability in, the, um, in that case? So um, now we will go on again to a bit of a different topic which will also touch upon uh, internet and internet shutdown, something we have not discussed yet. And um, I invite our next speaker who is online, Giovanni de Gregorio from the Universi University Católica Portuguesa in Lisboa. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so thank you so much. And of course, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you. I would be really, really brief just to introduce, you know, the topic of uh, and the connection, the dual connection between connection again and disconnection. Because I mean, another important topic to address is kind of the connection issues, you know, that uh, I think about most of you are quite aware of that, you know. You know? But one of the big problem is also this connection. It's also about the challenge posed by not only the, you know, unfamous, I would say nowadays, problem of internet shutdowns, but also by broad problems that are not just related to like switching off the internet, but also the problems that are related to network disruption. And network disruptions exactly means problems related, for example, to, you know, traffic, internet traffic that, for example, starts to be slow, that does not allow you not only to enter the digital space, not only to use the internet, but also to use the internet in a way that you can definitely use services on the internet. Because one important point is that nowadays the attention is focusing a lot on the problem of internet shutdowns and it's absolutely relevant. But we should not forget that there are different tactics and techniques to disconnect. So there is not just about switch off. There is also the possibility to discriminate traffic, for example, or doing other possibility or like censoring some spaces of the digital space or online spaces like social media spaces or other spaces. So what is particularly important is to understand that the strategy and the tactics of these connections are really becoming more complex than before. And what we're seeing is that it's a proliferation of these, taxes in, uh, these tactics in many places in the world, you know, not only, of course, in Latin America and Africa, but also, I mean, in Europe, we have different experience. And the problem with that is about the witness, not only the impact of these measures on human rights, but it's also about understanding why these measures are used or are implemented, because sometimes they're used, for example, to protect exactly rights, for example, to tackle the spread of disinformation and hate speech, but sometimes are also used, of course, to justify the tackling of this problematic, harmful content to achieve like other purposes, you know? And there have been plenty of cases. You don't need just me to tell you about that. You can just go online exactly, you know, and search for this. There are many out there, you know? There are also NGOs that have been work very, very hardly on mapping uh, these attempts. So the problem of connection, disconnection is actually, paradoxically, is one of the big issue that still we are addressing in the digital age. And, and again, this is a call not to think that um, the discussion of internet shutdowns is just a black and white discussion because it's much more complicated. There are a lot of nuances about the tactics and techniques that can be used to perform a shutdown, but it's also important to understand which are the consequences. Also because at the moment, there are not so many data um, that underline whether a shutdown is effective or not, for example, to take a late speech. Because usually if I say that a shutdown is helpful, for example, to take a late speech or disinformation, the problem is that when I switch on the internet back, the question is that no one has data on whether this shutdown, this network disrupt, disrupt has been effective or not. So this is actually the situation. And it's really important to understand that the discussion about access and the connection is not just about a discussion around freedom of expression, but it's a discussion about all human rights, but also about the possibility to use the internet architecture to achieve 
also the networks. You know, so this is actually the way in which we need to frame the discussion. Is very complicated. It's very important to protect freedom of expression, but it's also important not to forget the big picture and to understand that the switch off is the only way to to perform a network disruption because there are so many other possibilities, technical possibilities that are increasingly more problematic and invisible. So this is actually um, just to start the discussion around this topic and also to connect with all the others. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for um also discussing all these nuances uh, that you mentioned. It's uh, certainly not a black and white picture. And um, we will go on now to our next speaker, um, Olga. Let's see if I can pronounce that correctly. Goktus Polo from the University of Brussels, who's going to talk about accessibility and inaccessibility. Olga. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you very much, Evelyn. Uh, yes, um, I just would like to say that um, accessibility, actually I'm from the uh, Law Science Technology Society Research Group from the Health and Law Aging Law Lab of the Free University of Brussels. I'm a researcher there and my work is primarily focusing on um, accessibility, uh, but in another context. Um, and by that, I mean, when we speak about access, very often we have in our mind um, access to the internet or access to information or access to knowledge or access to literacy. But uh, sometimes we tend to forget, um, and it's something that's also become um, obvious in the comments, in the chat, in the online chat at least, um, that access for whom? Um, and uh, by that, um, my specific, for instance, uh, res my research in a specific context is in the context of data protection law, when we speak about protection of our personal data, um, how do we actually receive this information um, in the context of persons with disabilities, uh, meaning that if we um, uh, um, if this information if this knowledge uh, about how one can um, uh, exercise their data subject rights uh, for instance in the European Union context or in an in international context um, depending on the data protection law or the privacy law uh, applicable there um, can exercise these rights if, for instance, the information provided to them um, are not readable by a screen reader, if the person has um, a virtual impairment, um, or if it's an elderly person who does not have the necessary media literacy uh, for that. Um, and of course, we're all aware of dark patterns and um, other difficulties um, that uh, can cause um, hurdles with respect to accessing this information. So this is what I would like to very quickly add, um, that we also always need to contextualize when uh, we think of um, access and accessibility in the internet context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, for uh, pointing out the issue of inaccessibility and accessibility. We will go on now to our next speaker, Gitu, Gito Tsui, from the Engine Room in London. Gitu, you're also online, I believe. Yes, hi. Can everyone see and hear me okay? Um... Amazing. I will I assume people will let me know if they can't hear me. Uh, hi, I'm Kito. Thank you so much for having me. I want to think through the duality of accessibility and inaccessibility through the lens of biometric use in the humanitarian sector. A quick background of those of you, for those of you who aren't familiar, many humanitarian organizations are increasingly employing the use of biometric information, and that is iris scans, fingerprints, facial recognition, and so on, in the process of registration and service distribution for refugees. During that process, they've also created vast databases of highly personal information. And there's a deep irony or twist in the use of biometrics in the humanitarian sector, because its deployment is accompanied by promises of access that are belied by the introduction of new inaccessibilities. The conceit of humanitarian use of biometrics is initially simple. There's a desire to know who is receiving aid and to be able to track this. But who is gaining access in this process and what are they gaining access to? 
In many ways, it is not truly the impacted individual, sometimes called beneficiaries or recipients. In fact, it's all too frequently aid organizations, funders, and in certain cases, host states and even malicious actors. And being able to access biometrics, they are also able to access highly sensitive physical information that's immutable and utterly unique, information that marks you out from everybody else. The argument for biometrics revolves in part, in part about increasing access, faster, more efficient registration systems, and facilitating the use of cash transfer, which is a more unburdened way of access. It's easy to accept these claims wholesale, but they need to be examined more closely to consider what is lost, what is no longer accessible, and in what ways are these systems themselves fundamentally inaccessible. There are three main ways I want to highlight today, but there are many others, and I think that these help give us an understanding of the different manners in which we can understand inaccessibility and the complexity of thinking through access when, uh, when mediated through digital technologies. The first is physical inaccessibility, and another speaker discussed this briefly earlier. There's a reliance on everyone possessing the same physical characteristics from which data points can be extracted. For instance, in the case of fingerprints, those who have engaged in hard labour, elderly individuals and those who have cooked extensively, frequently women, uh, do not have fingerprints or do not have sufficiently legible fingerprints to be recorded. And that means that they cannot access or need to access in a different way these systems, right? And if the point of these systems is for faster or more efficient registration or to facilitate the use of things like cash transfer, these individuals no longer have the ability to access those particular mechanisms. And the second is individuals who are swept up in the intricacies of the system. In Kenya, Somali Kenyans who were registered as uh, when they were children as refugees within the UNHCR system in order for their families to access aid, find as adults they are unable to access their rights as citizens due to this dual registration. Correcting this has proven immensely challenging and the point of the system itself was to give access to certain individuals and it has fundamentally denied access in other regards. Obviously the loss of citizenship or the inability to access citizen citizenship is a huge trauma and has carries immense consequences for those who are facing it. The last is biometric systems being frequently inscrutable to those who are subject to them. The technical literacy required to understand not only biometric technology itself, but also the surrounding web protections, the possible risks, and therefore the ability to give meaningful consent in practice remains elusive. The inaccessibility of this knowledge therefore limits and the limits is places on consent, excuse me, calls into question if we should be really using technologies that the understanding of which is premised upon access, right? Access to time, resources and information and the full extent of information too. It is highly unlikely that it's going to be the case in many instances, not just in the use of biometrics, but across different technologies we use. We need to understand and complicate our notion of what it means to therefore agree to the use of them. Fundamentally, claims of accessibility have to be mapped out against more insidious realities of inaccessibility. In the case of biometrics, where the consequences of inaccessibility are so acute, like the loss of citizenship, and possible exclusion from aid systems or immense challenges in accessing them, or an asymmetry of information preventing true consent, it means however we understand accessibility, it has to be tempered by the sobering realities of how technology increases the barrier to meaningful access and places immense conditionality on some of the most vulnerable individuals who are attempting to access their fundamental rights. Thank you. Thank you again for um, sharing uh, this wonderful insights with us on accessibility and inaccessibility. Uh, we have now already heard different um, speakers upon this topic, and uh, which really shows that it uh, is a key topic to be discussed. And we now go on with our next speaker, um, Georgia Tersis. So uh, you're going to be talking a bit about a different topic again, or at least from a different perspective. We're going to take ethics now into the bigger picture. So our two last speakers, they're going to um, look at these um, topics a bit from an ethical and human rights perspective as well. So, Giorgio. Hi. Hello, everybody. Um, 
what I will present today, and I'm sorry for the slides, no one told me that you're not supposed to use slides, but uh, it's an ethical issue, it's very bit philosophical, so it might be useful. And I understand that I only have five minutes, so if you have, anyone wants the presentation, I can send it to you later. What I will present you very briefly today, it's a, a, a literature and policy review from the ethical lenses. Um, it is, I understand that it's a first world problem, the issue of inclusion and exclusion sometimes, but I think if one considers the opportunity costs, as they were referred before, it becomes a problem for the rest of the world as well. So I'll just see if this thing works, uh, and it doesn't. Can you move the slides with this? Yeah, so, uh, no. Uh, can I use this to move the slides? Yeah, anyway, um, so, can you hear me? Yes. So, um, the six different lenses that uh, I wanted to look at um, the approaches. The first is when you look at the uh, literature review and the policy review from the utilitarian perspective, there are three rather false premises. The first one is you know, the greatest happiness for the majority of people. But of course, this approach doesn't take into consideration the misery, if you like, of a minority of people who don't want to be part of the information society. My mom, who is 88, does not want to be part of the information society in Greece. She lives in Greece and she is forced to. Um, it also doesn't take into consideration the long-term consequences. So a lot of these policies are rather short-term. Uh, the second, of course, is the contractualist uh, ethics lens. And there are slides, by the way, for this, but I don't know. Can you try to move on. Um, also, from the contractualist point of view, like the social contract, a lot of policies take into consideration. We can move to the next slide. Um, next slide. Yeah. So, from the contractualist point of view, we take into consideration and we think that life is necessarily better in the information society or life outside the information society does not exist, cannot exist. Like uh, information inclusion is a sine qua non for life. But from the contractualist point of view, if you look, take this ethical approach, consent is necessary. And here we don't really have consent. And my mom never consented actually. And you know, I dedicate this to my mom actually. This is how the inspiration came. Uh, my mom never consented. My mom never signed a social contract for to being included and she was very happy and the quality of life before the information society was quite okay to be honest with you for her and for me as well. Um, next slide. Well, this is the deontological of course approach which of course as we know Emmanuel Kant, well you cannot always get what you want but um, the, the problem here is if you take a deontological approach then even when you think that you know, information society can be very harm harmful. So basically, the case of surveillance, the case like you know, the way that people live, especially during COVID, as it was uh, exp expressed before, you cannot escape because then it is basically a deontological uh, approach that everyone, no matter what the consequences, have to participate. Next slide. From the discourse uh, uh, lens, the Habermasian, if you like, approach will be that. You know, everyone, as long as they, you know, accept this and as long as it's not under coercion, it is okay. But can we actually really decently sit in here and claim that even the IGF is really inclusive and then that everyone's opinion has been included, including those who don't want to be part of the information society? Because we are in here preaching to the converted, right? The people who are not who don't want to be part of the information society are not represented here. So even with this approach, I will say that uh, the right to be excluded should be there. So we think that, and this is part of uh, my colleagues' approach as well, we think that actually we should approach uh, inclusion, the issues of inclusion as exclusion from virtue ethics, which is the middle ground. So you have the deficiency, the digital divide, you have the excess, which is the obligation for the inclusion, and there is must be somewhere in the middle. And of course, care ethics, and my time is up, which is the last uh, approach uh, 
that we should have uh, approach, we should approach uh, actually inclusion and exclusion through care ethics. And I will stop here. Well, I will, I will be very happy to share my slides and I can send you actually a brief, but it will be in the report as well. Um, well, care ethics means that we, only if you, you want and you should take into consideration basically that you know, negative side effects, if those are physical for cyberbullying, surveillance, etc. So I'll stop here because my time is up and uh, I think the next speaker will complement actually uh, the ethical approach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, adding this new perspective. Um, yeah, very interesting. I mean, uh, we talk about what's something which uh, to stay in my mind, we always talk about inclusion. Did we include the people who do not want to be part of our, this information society? I mean, that's a great question to to ask. And um, yeah, I would like to, to go on to our last speaker for today, Peter Kirschleger uh, from the University of Lucerne Institute of Social Ethics. Peter, please. Hi everyone, um, good to see you all and thank you so much for having me um, today. I would like to share my slides if that's possible. Um, can you it? So the online host would that'll be wonderful if that could be done. That I could um, share my slides. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anget. Peter, co-host. Um, Peter, I think uh, you should be co-host already. The technical stuff are technical. Doesn't work so far. Then I I do it without slides. I think it's better not you know to not to waste your time. So what I would like to start with is that, of course, you know, from an you know ethics of human rights perspective, and that will be the perspective I will take in my short presentation. Um, we have to, we have to face the fact that, on the one hand, of course, um, you know, digital transformation, internet access can provide us with um, positive potential, so that we can um, better actually fulfill the human rights of all humans. But on the other hand, we have also to be aware of the fact that we have to f struggle with ongoing um, digital human rights violations. And so we can see that the human rights standards, which are in place and in enforced in um, offline, are not um, enforced well in um, online. And how could we tackle this, this challenge? How could we master this challenge? Um, I would uh, invite us to consider the idea of human rights-based digital transformation and human rights-based database systems. So in order to have the same respect, the same protection of human rights offline and online, that we already in creating, designing, producing and using database systems and digital means and using the, the internet, we respect, we make sure that human rights are respected and are in, in place. Um, I just got the information that I should try again if it's working now. Unfortunately not, but that's okay. I do it just this way and then I will share the slides with you if you are if you are interested. So we have to we have to and deal, deal with that with this reality and from my point of view more rigorously. Um, so that we, um, I think it's not enough to have just a beautiful declaration. It's not enough to have beautiful recommendations. So we, I think we preach too much on Sunday and we don't do enough um, during the week. Um, so what, what I would suggest is that we um, respond to this digital human rights violations with stronger regulatory mechanisms. And I would ask for, and I would call for the creation establishment 
of an international database systems agency at the UN. Um, so an agency who would play the role of a regulatory authority in the field of digital transformation, in the field of the internet, in the field of database systems, in order to supervise and monitor what's happening in the digital sphere. I think that so that you don't think, well, the ethicists um, or the ethics professors now getting somewhere um, in, into some naive um, illusions or utopia. I think that in analogy to nuclear technology, you know, uh, simply put in nuclear technology, we have um, done research, we have created the bomb, we have dropped the bomb several times, and then we have understood as, as humanity that we have to do something in order to avoid the worse. Um, and we have created the International Atomic Energy Agency at the UN. Of course, I'm aware of the fact that this is not a perfect regime, it's not a perfect solution. I'm also aware of the geopolitical implications of that agency, but we have to acknowledge as well that we have been able to avoid the worse. And I would argue in a similar sense for an agency in the field of digital transformation database systems in the field of the internet, because it's not me, but even tech um, people like Elon Musk saying that, you know, artificial intelligence, digital possibilities are more dangerous than nuclear weapons. So I think it's time to act. And I think it's time to act on a global level in order to address the ethical challenges in this area, but also that we can benefit better from the ethical opportunities. Thank you so much for your attention. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Peter, for um, bringing in again this um, new perspective, a bit of a mix um, between ethics but also governance, like the question of uh, what we could be doing to, to manage these risks and regulate these technologies. We are now at the end um, of our speakers' presentations and would like to invite both our online audience and our on-site participants to um, to join the discussion and if you have questions to the speakers that would be the time to pose them. We will start with the online participants and collect some questions there. Um, our online moderator, uh, Caitlin, do you, or Caitlin finally, I think, will um, take uh, the online um, questions. Kathleen, please. Yes, yeah, so we're um, actually just still collecting questions, so it might be better to move to ones in the room first. Okay, sure, we can do that. So, please, any um, questions here in the room? Um, any points of discussion that participants uh, would like to add? <laughs> of course. As a human rights activist and a non-academic. Um, I think that the speakers all really highlighted the, 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 the nuanced way of looking at this and the risks of assuming, um, you know, that, 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 that uh, as I said, as we've been saying, that digital inclusion is uh, a synonym for inclusion, you know, that online rights gives us human rights. But if you have a big picture perspective, looking at the global north and the global south, and you can you can respond differently from them, has increased digital, digitalization and internet access taken us further towards more rights-based societies and governance, or not? I would have had actually quite a similar question. <laughs> that you posed that. Uh, who does want to answer that or who has uh, input for that? Any of the speakers? Peter, wants Peter yes, please. Well, thank you so much for this, for this contribution. I think you're absolutely right to answer the question because it's not that obvious. So I think what, what we need to be very, um, this, we have to be very precise on, on identifying, okay, what exactly were promises from a human rights perspective, digitalization. So I think about possibilities in the area of e-governance, um, possibilities in e-voting, access to information. I think you can name a few in the political sphere. 
But at the same time, we have to recognize that in certain economic um, spheres and domains, we have to tackle business models which are in their core human rights violating practices. So I'm not talking about negative collateral effects. We are talking about business models built upon human rights violations. Take, for example, the meta former Facebook case where you have racist hate speech happening in social media, leading to people really killing each other on the street and the company not doing something against, no, even firing up that hate discourse, that racist hate speech in order to keep people on their platforms and um, therefore being complicit of killing on the streets. Um, so things like that in the economic dimension need to be tackled as severe as they are tackled usually in, in the offline space. So we cannot, we cannot um, just accept or be indifferent to human rights violations happening or be on human rights violations happening in a digital sphere. Um, we have to tackle them as severely as possible, um, even if they're happening offline, as we do online. Yes, of course. Um, thank you. It's Henriette here again. Uh, Peter, thanks for that response. And I think Giovanni also talked about this. And I would just add one reflection on that, having worked as a development in development and social justice. I think probably, yes, there are more human rights in some respects. But I think what this digital inclusion and human rights debate has done, it's actually made civil and political rights hegemonic, and it's actually shifted the whole discussion of human rights towards being concentrated on civil and political rights, whereas in the 1980s, the 1990s, when there was a strong pushback from developing countries in the post-structural adjustment phase for more social and economic equality, the, the human rights-based approach was 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 accepted by the UN, um, and 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 economic, social, and cultural rights were 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 emphasised, um, even though some states have never signed that treaty. But I think since we've started talking about the internet and human rights, we have really lost that focus on all human rights being interconnected. Um, and we really just, at the IGF and many other spaces, we talk about civil and political rights and not social and economic rights. Yes, we have another question from the audience. Thank you. Uh, I, I come from uh, Ethiopia where only 25% of the population have access to the internet. And it has always been a luxury for us. So when I heard that the right not to access uh, internet is entertained as a human rights issue, I was surprised. What a contrast, I say. So uh, it's an interesting paradox, isn't it? Would you like to comment? On? Is, is it something reflective of the, the norms, or do you think that the right not to access is also reflected in uh, the developing world? My other question relates to, uh, you know, internet shutdown and all that. You know, in uh, countries like Ethiopia, it has been customary to shut the internet off during exams. And that's understandable because otherwise people would share answers via Telegram and all that. In fact, recently what happened is students were taken as hostage to universities where they had no access for uh, the internet for about a week, totally disconnected from the, uh, well, in, in pragmatic sense, I understand that. But what do you think of this in, in light of human rights uh, violation and all that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, due to the proceeding time, please, um, short comments and um, reactions also to the qu questions. Uh, do, and does anybody have an urgent question, urgent comment? Maybe online people, one last question or comment we can take also. Okay, so does anybody want to react to... Um, well, I can make a super quick. Yes, please. Uh, concerning your question, it's, uh, it's super interesting. Uh, I see both the right to access the internet and not to access the internet as complementary. So one does not exclude another. They should actually work together everywhere around the world. That's the shortest answer due to the time constraints. 
Can I give a short answer as well? Um, I mean, your question, absolutely, I understand it. We are still fighting for rights. Um, but I think the principle is that, that we really need people to have human rights. You know, and 25% of Ethiopians have access to the internet. How many Ethiopians have full access to other human rights, right, to clean water, to public health, to education? And I think it's, it's kind of a conceptual point, but I think it's an important point that we remember that having human rights and really having them be meaningful in people's daily lives requires more than internet access. That doesn't mean that the internet access should be there for everyone in Ethiopia. It should be. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have to close our session because the next session is already going to start in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much, uh, both to our speakers and also to the audience um, here um, in Addis and also online, of course. And um, I think these are discussions that will be ongoing. Like, we don't only need more internet, but we also need, like, um, a free universal internet that promotes um, civil and political rights, but also, of course, as Anne had added, um, economic and social rights, because human rights, they're indivisible, they're universal. So um, let's continue work in that uh, spirit. Thank you very much.